Hi everyone, welcome. <laughs> Cockatoos. Uh, hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Uh, obviously, in this episode, we've got the engine in the car, which is great. Uh, I run through the fuel system, bulkhead layout, uh, the process that I went through for that, including the insulation. Uh, we've got the gearbox sort of semi in place. Uh, I did some carpeting, a little bit of wiring, uh, and a little bit of fabrication. So we'll run through all that sort of stuff, starting to make some good progress. So fall on, I'm, I'm going to have to uh, bite the bullet and get stuck into this wiring loom. And uh, then we should be able to fire this thing up. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, I've been enjoying just building the car and as always uh, follow uh, along on 105 Motorsport uh, on Instagram or put any comments down below. Uh, criticisms are always welcome uh, if they're constructive and uh, also uh, if you have any questions by all means leave them there and I'll try and get to them as quickly as possible. Hope everyone's great. Thanks for watching. Despite my best efforts, I did have to pull the intake manifold off for this one to lift the engine in. Uh, but we can see we've got it rigged up here with the load leveling bar. They're about 60 odd dollars, but they make life infinitely easier when you're lifting, a, lifting an engine in and out. Uh, I've also got my engine crane, which I pretty much like to refer to as a council worker because it costs heaps, sits around and does nothing, but it's invaluable in the, in the workshop. Uh, and I've also uh, just got the bulkhead set out there. Everything's been marked, triple checked. Uh, apart from the things like the catch can that I have to work out where I'm going to put and also my oil accumulator. So the idea is here is that we're going to fit the engine up. Uh, we're going to make sure that we've got clearance for everything uh, that we need to mount the firewall, to, need to mount to the firewall in front of the engine. And then we're also, then basically we're going to pull it all back out, mount everything up on the firewall. Well, first we'll be drilling everything and putting everything in, and then we're going to need to insulate it and then mount everything on the firewall. And then we can uh, remount the, the motor and the gearbox and I'm hoping we shouldn't have to really pull it again. Uh, we'll be leaving it in there whilst we build the loom, uh, the, the wiring loom for the car, and uh, hopefully we won't pull it out for a while. It should do its job in there and, and hopefully not give us any trouble. Anyhow, look, uh, we'll get stuck into it. As you can see, uh, what normally happens with these engine uh, type cradles is that they interfere with everything getting mounted. So first thing is we're gonna have to lift the engine up, uh, then we can fit the, the clutch and the pressure plate, and we can also fit the adapter plate for the Bosch gearbox. Uh, and then uh, we can do the engine mounts and we'll get it in there and go from there. One thing we're going to do before we install the engine is just measure up for this belt. Uh, all you need to do is you can use anything flexible, a bit of rope, uh, a bit of old wire that you've cut off, whatever, or you can steal your grandma's tape measure. Um, and all you need to do is just measure the length. Uh, don't make sure you've got enough sort of length in it to. Uh, what do you say, like fit the belt on at minimum tension as well. Uh, obviously belts will stretch over time a little bit, so you need to allow for that. Uh, if we measure this here, talking 790, uh, we're at sort of the minimum adjustment plus a few mil, so that way we can get the belt on to start with, and we've got the maximum adju adjustment here uh, as we need it to, to uh, I guess, tension the belt. Here's the engine mounts themselves. We've got the adapter plate, the engine mount itself. There's a spacer plate because the rubber on the back of that uh, engine mount actually has a little recess in it that we need to allow for. Uh, we've got the bolts that are actually going to mount to the chassis, and we've got all the fasteners here. Interestingly, we're using a nylock nut on the engine mount to adapter plate, uh, which is interesting because of the fact that normally nylon won't stand up to super high temps but look i'm gonna defer to ultima's expertise on that they've probably tried it a few times and and uh know that it works uh we've got the uh torque wrench there and we've also got some red thread locker red being the high temp stuff uh you can note that i think we discussed in the last video all these fasteners are labeled as 8.8 .8 grade fasteners so they're they're sort of heavy duty jobs which makes sense uh and we're going to we're going to tighten these up in three stages uh to get the right torque on them uh, it's important to do that just because it gives you a, a good reliable uh feel for seating everything properly and it also uh just enables you to make sure that your torque wrench is operating as you'd expect and get a feel for things uh lest you make the wrong adjustment on your micrometer there and uh and actually just uh, you know snap off a bolt or something like that and have to deal with that okay so we're just installing the clutch pivot into the gearbox here uh, i'm just going to quickly explain how that works and how you would diagnose uh, a thrust bearing uh, failure which is uh, typically what you would see in terms of a failure that isn't the clutch where people say that i've had a clutch issue uh, the way that you tell that is that this bearing effectively what happens is we can see in the gearbox there there's a pivot up here and uh, this is installed like this uh, when you push on the clutch, the hydraulic cylinder here extends. That pushes this off, along that shaft, and the bearing engages with the 
uh, back of the, the clutch spring here, which is forced in there, which releases the pressure on the clutch and enables it to spin freely of the, uh, of the, of the flywheel, um, which is sitting there. Uh, the, the clutch itself is obviously geared onto uh, the drive shaft into the gearbox, uh, so you don't get any drive. Now what happens is that these bearings uh, inevitably do wear out. Um, so uh, the way to sort of identify how this can be an issue is that if you put it into neutral, uh, release the clutch and you're getting quite a bit of noise, uh, you'll find that it is this bearing that is being a bit of trouble. Being a bit of trouble. Uh, there really isn't uh, any major drama in terms of replacing these. They're fairly cheap and fairly easy to do. The only downside is that you do have to pull your gearbox. So that's where all the energy uh, goes into. Uh, now, just in terms of uh, this being a, a Porsche gearbox and mating it up to an LS, uh, one of the issues that you have is that uh, the flywheel that suits the Porsche gearbox is significantly smaller than what you would typically see uh, in in a you know an LS type vehicle. Um, basically what happens is if you have a smaller diameter clutch, a smaller size clutch, you require a higher, uh, what do you say, pressure plate force to be able to get the same uh, transfer, transfer of torque through the gearbox. Now what that does is that that also means that uh, having a higher uh, force pressure plate puts more uh, weight, oh, sorry, more force onto the, the thrust bearing in the motor. And uh, basically that's a bearing that uh, operates on your crankshaft uh, and and also between the bearing journal and the, and the main or uh, well, the main caps there, um, depending on the sort of arrangement that you have in the engine. Uh, and what can happen is, is that if you have too high a force in this, uh, you can actually ch chew out the thrust bearing in the engine. Uh, so that is an issue that I've seen uh, some people talk about uh, with these types of arrangements. Uh, they've gone to usually multi-plate carbon type setups. Uh, it, the the greater the number of plates that you have. Uh, for a given size, the lower the pressure plate force that you can have, because when you go through a multi-plate setup, it's a it's the equivalent of having a much larger surface area on a single plate clutch, if that makes sense. Uh, so anyway, I hope that all all does sort of make sense to you. But uh, that's sort of the arrangement that we've got here. Uh, this literally just sits in there, slides on that shaft, and there's a tiny little spring clip that just uh, pops over that that little. Uh, there's sort of a little ball on the end of that hydraulic piston there uh, that's the clutch, clutch actuator and uh, that's all you need to do. Uh, this will obviously get installed on the engine and uh, we'll start getting this thing all together. We can see here that uh, despite my concerns we've actually got heaps of room here. Uh, there's probably you know four or five inches at the front of the motor there between the firewall so that's great. It's going to help us uh, obviously protect the, the cabin from heat and uh, enable us to run everything along that firewall without too much trouble. Uh, we can see here that the water pump's actually going to sit reasonably well. I just need to uh, get a slightly neater pipe uh, just to connect that so it's not misaligned at all or putting any stress on all of that. Otherwise, um, there's not much to it. The only thing which is, I guess, a, a bit of a concern to me is I need to carpet this bulkhead. And once I get it installed and get the motor installed and the box installed and everything, I don't want to be pulling all that out again uh, once I get the center tub section on to lay that carpet in. So I need to sort of think about that. I'm thinking about adhering the carpet to this. Uh, obviously, there's going to be an overlap around it. Uh, or maybe just cutting it in a few select places uh, and adhering it to this back panel so that then once the center tub's on, I can just put in a, a couple of extra bits. I don't really want to be trying to cut it whilst it's, it's, whilst, whilst the center tub's in place. It might be a bit difficult, but we're gonna, I'm just gonna have to think that through and, and work out where I want to get to with that. Uh, I've measured up the crossover for the uh, electrical that's gonna run across to feed the starter motor from the alternator connection. Uh, otherwise, I also, just fitted up the exhaust headers on this side. And I wanted to just do that because it's always nice to get a bit of an idea about how you're gonna fit things up in terms of what process. You can see that it's very tight. Um, these are obviously ceramic coated headers and there is an option which uh, I wasn't aware of. I thought it was a standard thing, but the, the option for the headers to come up and sort of snake around here that you might've seen on other people's uh, Ultima builds. Uh, but we can see there that it's very tight. And I just, the reason I did that is I just wanna know that uh, I actually need to fit the collector in first uh, and then fit the, the front uh, or rear section in this in this case of the uh, of the headers, then the front section of the headers, and uh, that should get it all in there. Uh, otherwise, all all looking pretty good. Now I just have to undo all the work that I've done, and then finally sort of get the box in place. Uh, I'll be protecting the chassis with a bit of foam and whatever like that. Get the box in place, get it sitting in there, and then I need to mount the engine, and then I'll mount the box to the engine. Uh, obviously, the flywheel and, and clutch and all that sort of stuff will get mounted in the interim there as well. Uh, there isn't an opportunity to feed the box in through the back, I don't believe. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that, anyone who has more expensive with more experience with Ultimas than me, uh, but the idea is I'll just put it in there, sit it on the chassis, and then, then connect it all up. So uh, we'll see how that goes.
So we've got the motor set up here. It is now unsupported on the engine crane. You can imagine once the gearbox is all mounted up, there'll actually be some support, support at the rear of the engine, which should should sit it up a little bit higher. Uh, the one thing which was, uh, I guess, a calculated sort of question uh, when I was choosing uh, the components for this engine was the sump, because we always knew it was gonna be a very close fit to this cross brace in the engine bay. What we've come down to is around about, I'll try and show you here, uh, it'd be lucky to be two mil or less of uh, gap here between the bottom of the sump and that cross brace. The, the thing that I'm happy about is that I don't have to uh, do any major modifications to a sump or, or buy a new sump, which was a big question, but I have had to throw some more cash at uh, a remote f oil filter adapter kit because uh, the oil filter itself is actually the only thing that would foul on that uh, on that cross brace. Uh, downside, uh, sort of upside as well as this is being able to put in a remote filter mount means that I can change it more easily and have it in a position where oil won't piss out of the filter when I change it and drop on everything. Uh, I use these and I've used them on a couple of engines now uh, because they're reasonably competitively priced. They're about 300 Australian dollars. Uh, is an Aeroflow remote filter mount kit. Uh, there's a part number here somewhere uh, because I'll forget it later. AF64042, that didn't focus. Uh, basically, they're a universal kit, so you get a, an adapter plate that bounces up to your engine. Uh, this green little adapter suits an LS thread type, uh, but there's a number of threads here to suit different engines, so uh, I think the Ford ones actually just screw on directly, straight away. Um, these are a, a thread on the actual remote filter mount itself to suit a Ford type filter, uh, but you can get one to suit LS's, so I'll look at that in a bit, bit of a later time. Uh, but for the moment, this should get us out of trouble. The thing which I like about these as well is that they're black, so they work on everything. Uh, there's no additional uh, sort of clearance issues around around the filter mount itself. So, you know, where this sump has uh, some obstructions around where the filter screws on, you're not gonna have any clearance issues. Uh, they're O-ringed, which is quite nice. Uh, and other than that, being black, they sort of suit most engines. Uh, if you were to price this up independently, I mean, you, it comes with some AN10 hose, a couple of meters of that. You're probably talking 60 or 80 bucks for that. It is 100 series. Uh, the way that you can identify that is these AN fittings don't have an olive. They are just a, a standard type fitting, but that's fine for the type of pressure that you're talking about with an oil system. I just use 200 across the board because I find them uh, more fail safe, I guess, to to sort of make and, and utilize. So I've got some AN10 fittings that I, I plan to use for this anyway, so I'll use them. But see how that doesn't have an olive, so that's how you can tell the difference with them. Uh, the only thing otherwise to be aware of this is when you're routing your holes, your, your hoses, sorry, uh, these holes uh, do have an in and an out. So make sure you don't reverse the flow on your filter because most filters have an anti-drain back valve, which is just a rubber flap uh, that you'll find. So the, the red bit in there is actually just a rubber sort of one-way valves to stop this draining empty when you shut your engine off and then having to prime it uh, every, each time you start the engine, which would mean that you're not gonna get adequate oil flow to the engine straight away. Uh, you want the oil coming in the sides and out the out the bottom hole there. So one to be aware of. Uh, it's not like a real estate agent where you can just have shit coming out both holes, uh, but uh, that's, the, that's the main thing to be aware of with these. Uh, other than that, they're, they're pretty straightforward. Like I say, reasonably well priced. So we'll get that. It's a, it's a bit of a pain to throw some more money at it, but it's not the, um, it's not the end of the world. Uh, I'm pretty happy that the, the sump's gonna work and it's gonna fit there. I'd like a little bit more clearance. Generally, you want sort of, you know, more like five or seven mils clearance rather than two. But once we get the uh, gearbox in, it'll support the rear of the engine a bit. We should increase that clearance a little bit. And uh, I'll put some protection on that cross brace. And if I see it marring it, or I notice that it actually has been touching it under hard acceler acceleration, then uh, I can always just put in a couple of minor spaces on the engine mounts or even just jack the back of the gearbox a little bit just to, to get that you know extra mil or so of clearance. It is sort of that level of tolerance. Just quickly, the one thing that you can do with these uh, remote filter uh, adapters as well is you'll see there's actually a couple of ports in there. You can, uh, what do you say, just quickly uh, grind off any of the sharp edges and stuff like that as you would when you're porting a cylinder head, for example, just to increase flow. It's not... It's not a super huge improvement, uh, particularly on ones that have been well machined to start with, but uh, it is something that is possible to do. Uh, it'll just mean that the oil is going to flow through there a little bit better and ensure that you're not going to run into any uh, major pressure pressure restrictions because of the sharp edges. But uh, for the moment, look, I've just added some oil to this filter adapter and I'll screw it on now. I won't do it up tight just yet because I want to actually... Uh, have a look at how I'm going to route the AN hoses and then I'll, that will sort of dictate, you know, even a quarter turns difference just to make sure that the hose routing is as good as it can be.
Okay, you can see the insulation here on the lower section. Uh, obviously, I've got all the mounting holes there so that I can run all of my lines and that sort of thing. And uh, obviously, I made a comment earlier about the fact that it would have been nice to have pre-drilled all of this uh, prior to installing the panel uh, earlier in the build. Now, at the factory, uh, the reason that they don't, uh, I guess, sort of like signal that to you is because they don't run insulation on these bulkhead panels. Uh, aluminium itself is obviously relatively shiny, so it actually repels a fair bit of that radiant heat anyway. Um, and, you know, based on their experience, they, they sort of haven't had or don't consider it to be too much of an issue in terms of the heat uh, control. But when I put down this insulation on the back of the panel here, uh, the issue is, is that I've drilled all these holes for the mounts and it's very hard to locate them once the insulation's in place. Uh, with this insulation, because it's slightly thinner, I was able to just be able to make out where the holes were uh, to be able to uh, put the rivets in and you know position all these clips and that sort of thing. Whereas if I'd used the thicker stuff like I have on the uh, upper panel here, I simply wouldn't have been able to see the, pen the holes behind it. Uh, you can see here, uh, all the mounts that I've drilled, uh, I wouldn't be able to see on this side because of the, the thicker insulation. Uh, I intended to use this stuff on the lower bulkhead panel, but I simply wouldn't have been able to locate it. I could have made up a template and tried to locate uh, each of the mounting points, but look, that would have been uh, probably still an element of guesstimation, which means that you would have been making holes that were larger than necessary in the insulation. And then that would have left, led to a, an end product that mightn't have been quite as nice as you would have hoped for. You know, you don't want to have sort of like, oh, I think it's about here and it ends up being sort of, you know, five mil over here. And then you have a bigger hole in the insulation and it looks a bit rubbish. So uh, that's the reason that I've gone down that path. Uh, obviously, with the benefit of hindsight, I would have drilled that lower panel completely uh, when I, before I'd installed it in the car to start with. But it's not the end of the world. I think there's still going to be a good amount of insulation in there. And uh, I guess the other thing is, is that the distance between the front of the engine and the back of that bulkhead is, is a lot bigger than I actually ever envisaged. So the air gap there is going to be uh, very helpful. Uh, this actually took a heap of time to install this insulation because I had to cut it and sort of form it. So it's relatively sort of thick, this aluminium type stuff. So it's almost like bending light gauge uh, metal into place. Uh, and it doesn't look as bad. Like all of these sort of dents and stuff like that actually, it's just sort of little lighting in here that makes that look terrible. Uh, Anyhow, uh, we'll get this uh, sort of marked out. I'm going to poke a, basically just a mandrel off one of the um, off one of the rivets uh, back through the back side of this, uh, just so I can locate all the mounting points, and then I'll uh, get, stick this in the car and get everything mounted up, and uh, we'll go from there. Right, so I'm just fitting off a couple of these electrical connections now that I know the lengths that I need. Uh, I don't know whether I've covered this before, but generally the process that I follow for really large electrical cable like alternator or battery feeds or whatever is um, just to trim away the insulation just using a Stanley knife. Uh, it's uh, very easy to do it and ensure that you don't take away any of the copper, which is pretty important. Uh, and then it's just a matter of making sure that you get some decent lugs, uh, fitting them on, Orienta orientating them so that the cable sort of lends itself to holding itself in place which means that all your mounts your p-clips zip ties whatever aren't under stress continually and over time uh, sort of encourages them to fail uh, and then i just use a big punch and just flatten it out and then use some heat shrink over the top uh, there are specialist tools that can that you can use to do this sort of stuff they're reasonably expensive unless you're an auto elect doing it all the time uh, sometimes uh, as john mcginnis says you've just got to piss with the dick that you've got um, speaking of which, actually, there was a Collecting Cars podcast between Chris Harris and John McGuinness, who's uh, basically one of, if not the best TT, Isle of Man TT riders uh, ever in history. It's it's a cracker. Definitely recommend having a having a listen to it. Uh, I am a bit of a bike tragic as well as a, as well as a car lover. So um, no, if you're interested in that stuff and you want to want to sort of listen to blokes who have uh, probably got a screw loose and and definitely uh, live on the edge, that's that's a, a worthwhile thing to listen to. Anyhow, we'll get this done. All right, so I need to make a bracket up for this. Uh, I'm sorry if I sound a bit sick. Uh, unfortunately, I've got a bit of a cold, so everyone in this day and age is looking at me like I've got two heads. Um, I have tried the regular remedies like uh, essential oils and salt lamps, uh, but that hasn't helped me. So uh, I just having to wait wait this one out. Uh, but but what I need to do is I need to make the backing plate at least for the bracket that's going to hold the accu sump so that I can get the mounting points on the upper bulkhead section uh, because I need to do that prior to obviously installing the insulation so I can access it from the back side and I'm going to know where my mounting points are and also so that I can just uh, finish off the carpeting and get the bulkhead installed uh, so that then I can install the motor and box. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing with that is effectively I just have my accu sump, I'm going to have a backing plate and then a ring at the bottom 
which is going to sit around the bottom here and a ring at the top is going to sit around here and that's just going to hold it all in place. Uh, to do that, I've just got a rolling machine here. Uh, I bought the, purchased this one here. It's about 300 bucks. Uh, what it allows you to do is it's a guillotine, a bender, a brake bender and um, a roller in one. So we're just going to use that uh, to form up this ring like I have here already and then we're going to weld that to the backing plate, the aluminium backing plate. Uh, we might put a couple of uh, holes in it with some dimple dies just to give a bit of structural rigidity there to hold it in place uh, and, and we'll go from there. Here's the bracket that I'm partially the way through just uh, fabricating for that's going to hold the Aki sump. Uh, I'm just using a dimple die here just to press in. Uh, what this does is it basically just tapers the hole uh, and gives a nice finish. And typically you just see this in motorsport uh, applications just because it help it can help pull, uh, what do you say, material out of the, the bracket itself, which is going to save weight. Uh, it also adds some rigidity to uh, sort of thin wall panels. So that's why uh, the factory would have done it in here. Uh, just in the footwell there, you can see they've used the same type of application. Uh, all it is is just effectively like a hydraulic press, um, and in my case, mine's a bit of an agricultural one. I'm going to try and do this one-handed without destroying the thing. Uh, and you can see that just seating down there. Uh, you just get it in place, and it will give you that finish. Uh, that's all there is to it, really. Uh, this one also. Uh, is a hydraulic hole press. Uh, it just gives a nicer cut than what you would get with a standard hole saw. Uh, I can actually show how uh, that's that's used uh, in another video if people are particularly interested. This bit of equipment is sort of a bit more expensive. It's sort of, you know, uh, even for a basic kit, you're sort of talking about $600 odd dollars, but uh, it is quite good if you are fabricating things. Uh, the other thing that we're getting onto now is uh, just the rear bulkhead carpet. So uh, the instructions aren't the clearest uh, in my mind when it comes to the rear bulkhead carpet. Uh, obviously we've got the rear bulkhead here. Uh, once it's in the car it's going to be very difficult to get access to any carpeting, especially once the, the center section is fitted. So uh, the, the factory does talk about cutting uh, some multiple sections here. I don't want to have any visible cut lines because I think it'll look a bit rubbish. But the thing is, is that obviously you can see here when you have the carpet laid down, uh, trying to form it around this and contend with the roll bars is a bit, is a bit trickier. Uh, I'm still not sure how I'm actually going to attack that. But what I'm going to do is, is because I need to get this bulkhead in so I can keep moving, uh, I'm going to glue the carpet down into this whole flat section. I'm going to leave it in a huge single piece. I'm going to cut out, uh, obviously, the, the concession that you need to make for the roll bar because uh, that's definitely going to be required. And then once I fit the center section on the car, I should be able to just sort of peel it back and work around. I'll probably have to pull the center section off, which I'm planning on doing anyway once I uh, mark out all the cutouts for the dash and that sort of stuff and then I'll fit it back on and, and go through all of that putting on the Alcantara on the dash but uh, yeah for the moment I'm just going to glue that in place it's going to leave these big flappy bits of carpet in, in situ but uh, I'm hoping that I can do that all in a single piece which will look as neat as possible so we'll see how that goes uh, if it fails or if anyone else who's done this before thinks that I'm having a massive oversight then please let me know all right, we're just working on the carpet here. So all I'm doing is just marking this. Uh, I've basically got the front edge sorted out so that it looks as neat as possible. Obviously, that's the one that you're going to see, so it's important to get that to align properly. Uh, and then I'm just going to take out any excess at the rear here. Uh, it pretty much just involves laying down the glue and uh, just sort of feeding this in carefully so that it all seats in position. And uh, then that should do, uh, do the carpet. Um, apart from that, there's sort of no other issue uh, with the glue that they do provide from Ultima, uh, you are going to get very high. Uh, so keep in mind that uh, if you're not interested in that, you probably want to do it in a well ventilated space. I'm not doing it in a well ventilated space, so uh, I'm having to take a break every so often, uh, unless I start to space out or talk even more shit than usual. This is a low pressure fuel pump. It mounts here on the chassis and it feeds the swirl pot, which will then feed the high pressure fuel pump that passes fuel to the rail. Uh, the one thing with any fuel pumps, and particularly these low pressure types, they tend to be fairly noisy buggers. Uh, in this case, Ultima have provided a sort of rubber vibration mount. It's good to have a set of these. Uh, I pretty much recommend that you just grab um, you can get an assortment of these or even buy kits off the internet. So do these and just leave them in your workshop. They're pretty useful. Uh, in this case, it's uh, vibration isolation between the chassis and the mount here and also vibration mounts uh, between the, the bracket and the pump itself. So that's that's quite good. And we're just going to mount this up here. It's probably not the ideal ho uh, sort of fuel uh, mounting or, or fuel setup that I would have run. Uh, but keeping in mind that um, I need to sort of be half reasonable about modifying absolutely everything and chasing the rabbit hole. I mean, going down the rabbit hole to um, in terms of cost and also uh, trying to re-engineer everything myself. Um, but 
in fairness, uh, this probably works for you know a number of different engine applications for Ultima, and it, it is reasonably well. And all these hoses that come from Ultima, Ultima are obviously uh, pre-made as well. So I'm not, you know, for me to change that would actually be uh, quite a fair bit of work, and I'm not sure it would in the end, you know, be worth it, uh, you know, unless you were doing a particular show car or something like that. And here's the final bulkhead layout. Uh, we can see here that we've got the swirl plotter on the left, the overflow for the uh, or coolant expansion tank on the right, uh, and then we've got the fuel pressure regulator here. Uh, I've got a three port catch can there, which we're gonna have to find somewhere to vent. Uh, in Australia, it, it, for it to be legal, it has to actually vent back into the inlet manifold. So we'll probably block that off for uh, registration purposes. And then they have a habit of being uh, vented to atmosphere. Not that I would do anything wrong like that. Um, otherwise, it's just a matter of obviously keeping things cool that you wanna keep cool. So uh, anything that has any heat shielding on it is obviously uh, fuel that we're looking to keep the heat out of and anything that isn't insulated is pretty much the coolant and that's obviously because we want to try and get as much heat out of those vessels as possible. Uh, one thing to look at here is the fuel system. Uh, we can see here that there's a low pressure fuel pump and what that does is that draws from the tank and feeds it into this vessel here. Uh, this vessel here then gets uh, has a feed that comes out of the bottom of the tank there into a high pressure fuel pump which goes up here through that filter into the fuel pressure regulator and then into the rail. This particular fuel pressure regulator actually return, uh, sort of bleeds off any excess fuel uh, and moderates the pressure at the fuel pressure regulator uh, and then drains it back to your, uh, what do you call swirl pot here uh, with any excess in the swirl pot then being fed back to both tanks. But the disadvantage and one thing I don't like about these particular fuel pressure regulators is they'll tell you what the pressure is at at the regulator uh, and moderates it here and then sends sort of like the excess fuel at a certain pressure to the rail. Uh, I tend to prefer the ones that actually sort of feed the, the fuel pressure, the fuel pump uh, feeds the rail and then on the return end of the rail you'll have... Um, you'll have a fuel pressure regulator which will moderate the pressure and then bleed off the excess. Uh, it's a little bit simpler when you run that in certain installations. Uh, it also tells you what your moderates the pressure I think a little bit better in at, like in terms of what's physically at the rail as distinct from uh, what's what's at your fuel pressure regulator there. Uh, it's just a it's a bit of semantics. Um, these are completely fine. It's just a different style of setup. Uh, I know that Genvi for example uh, they recommend the one that I sort of prefer uh, but we're going to run with this for the moment because it works for Ultimas and um, the factory provided me that fuel pressure reg. Uh, just on that, what you'll typically see uh, on on lots of fuel pressure regulators is uh, what they have is a, uh, a pneumatic port here uh, and you basically plumb, it, plumb in your manifold pressure into that port. Now what that does is, if you think about it, uh, when you're moderating the fuel pressure here, uh, the fuel pressure is effectively the differential pressure between your combustion chamber and also your fuel rail. Uh, now you'll have, uh, I guess, an optimum point for your injectors to run at in terms of that fuel pressure. So what happens here is if you're running a boosted application, as you start to uh, run into boost, this will actually increase the, the fuel pressure proportionally to make sure that that differential pressure across your injector remains the same. So that's why you have rising rate uh, fuel pressure regs. In my case, I'm running natural, naturally aspirated motors, uh, so uh, I don't actually need this. I'll just find a little plug and, and block that off so it's a, so it's a bit, little less unsightly. Uh, but that's pretty much that one there. Obviously, uh, you're wondering if, you, if you're sort of new to this, why you would bother having a, a high pressure fuel pump and a low pressure fuel pump and uh, this vessel here. And the reason being is that if you think about it, uh, I'll draw a little diagram here. Uh, if you've got a fuel tank and it's a very large vessel like this, and you get, well, that was on the piss. Um, it's a very large vessel like this, and your fuel pickup is here. Uh, when you go around a corner, if you end up with your fuel uh, sort of at 45 degrees here, you can potentially run into starvation issues. So what you do is you have a low pressure fuel pump, and that's always running along here, sucking from this point here. And on average, this is enough. So obviously between acceleration and deceleration, on average, this fuel pump will provide enough fuel to the swirl pot, pot which is a very long and skinny tube. And then obviously uh, when it's at 45 degrees in here, it doesn't really matter because even though your fuel pickups in the bottom here, uh, you can run at 45 degrees and you never run into starvation. One thing that you do need to be conscious of uh, with this is when you're sizing your low pressure fuel pump, which this is like the worst drawing ever, when you're sizing your low pressure fuel pump, uh, if you're doing something like racing at uh, Le Mans, 
um, you would run into issues potentially because you're on the open throttle for those huge long straights for lots of, such a long time that if you undersize this uh, most of the time this would be adequate because you're gonna have a fuel demand that's like under acceleration you know off the throttle under acceleration off the throttle but at Le Mans you have such a long and and a prolonged uh, period of being hard on the throttle that if this is uh, actually not sized at the same flow rate not the same pressure but the same flow rate as your your high pressure fuel pump you will run into fuel starvation issues it's actually something you'll see surface at uh, guys who will start to run like you know those thou mile long drags or whatever it is uh, and they can run into those types of issues but uh, just food for thought and that's part of the reason why you uh, run the run a swirl pot. Uh, now let's get this engine installed because uh, laying out this bulkhead actually was super time consuming and pretty much destroyed my soul. So uh, I'm keen to get the engine installed and uh, see it in the car finally and uh, I guess get a sense of satisfaction out of that. All right, well, uh, thanks everyone for watching. It's probably a good place to, to leave it. Uh, in the next video, I will do some docking uh, of the engine and gearbox and uh, we'll also perhaps have a look at the electrical we might do some welding for that uh, oil accumulator uh, sort of brackets and apart from that so I uh, suppose we'll have to start getting stuck into uh, some of the final things like maybe a bit of uh, panel work doing a bit of painting it'd be nice to warm up a little bit so we could do that but uh, I'm sure I'll find a way to get around that and uh, yeah otherwise keep really well uh obviously comments down below criticisms are always welcome or any or any helpful tips uh, i know in the last video someone gave me a, a tip on a really good reference book for nuts and bolts and fixings that sort of stuff which i purchased uh otherwise uh that sort of itch it uh if you watch the f1 on the weekends uh, uh i think everyone will agree that it was 100 percent lewis's fault and max is in the clear so uh look if you don't if you don't agree with that as well then you can always torch me on that thanks very much